thank you for taking the time to hang out with me. And I hope I, will, I have the lights not in my face yet. I could look at you. Hope we can have some fun today. Maybe learn a thing or two. And I hope you're sitting nice and comfortable. Let's pour another drink. Let's get going. Let's get going. Now, I have to admit, I'm very, very, very sick of the cloud. Not necessarily the ideas that they represent or the promises of the cloud, but just the terms. Because I do a lot of presentations about cloud, also to non-technical people. And then I have to go through all the fluff. I have to talk about SaaS and PaaS and IS and about public and private and hybrid and all this marketing mumbo jumbo. And I'm very, very much sick of all the fluff that is being told. Now, there's this one picture I always use, and I, because of lack of time, I won't go to the entire game and the entire spiel, but I, I usually ask people what's on that picture, and they always tell, oh, I see a plug and, and I see a socket. But in fact, you see a person doing vacuum cleaning, and uh, what, what this entire picture represents is a level of abstraction that is generated. Everything behind this very wall is none of that person's concern. And uh, you're also, also that metaphor of core business. Core business at that point is vacuum cleaning. Maybe have some visitor, visitors in the evening. You're organizing a party and you want the house to be spotless. You want it to be clean. So you do your business. But there's so much technology and so much levels of complexity in that just the fact of doing vacuum cleaning that we're not aware of. We're not aware of how the wires are connected behind the socket and how that is connected to the fuse box and how that is connected to the outside world, the grid, and what kind of power plants are used to generate that electricity that we use just for the sheer fact of vacuum cleaning. We don't know that. And that's very much the representation of cloud, right? You apply a level of abstraction, that is what you do, and what you gain from that is flexibility. And you leverage that flexibility to generate basically operational stability. That is the promise of the cloud. And to enforce that, you need tons of automation. And this talk is an automation talk about cloud platforms. And you might know that there's many, many, many cloud platforms out there. Just to give you an idea, these are just a couple of popular ones or popular cloud platforms, some with external vendors, some stuff you can do in-house like OpenStack or VMware or what have you. So those are the big ones. And every single piece of technology has its own automation suite, its own rules and tools, and that makes it a lot more difficult to standardize on. And once you pick one, you're gonna, usually going to stick with it because the level of efforts you've put into it to make it happen are so enormous and the budget you assign to it in terms of development, R&D, setting it up, keeping it maintainable, are quite a lot. And as of a consequence, you're mostly locked in that, to that vendor. And that's the sweet spot where most of them want to keep you. Now, I'm going to talk about a couple of tools, primarily about Terraform and also about Packer, and then use Ansible as a sort of utility tool to glue it all together. And these tools should help us build, provision, orchestrate vendor agnostic cloud environments. That's the goal. There are some other goals as well. So what we want to achieve by the end of this presentation, and I hope you'll agree with me on that, is uh, less lock-in, less vendor lock-in, being in much more of a comfortable position to switch from provider A to provider B, do faster deployments, scale better based on dynamic capacity, have better reproducibility of our environments by just cloning our environments using automation to have staging, test, uh, development environments with little effort and a, a valid copy of our production environment. Also, by doing uh, lots of automation, we reduce the human error, which is also quite a, a factor in, in our industry. And this is, this is essentially the promise of the cloud, but I do not believe in that. And people who, who host stuff in the cloud these days, like lower cost, is that really it? Not really. The flexibility to spend what you want is there, but lower cost is not really there. But you can have lower cost if you automate more, if you have less errors, if you have less outages. You'll have a level of operational stability, and the price you'll have to pay for that is less than if you have to do it all manually. That I agree with. Now, that being said, hi, my name is Thijs. That is indeed how you pronounce this. I'm a Dutch-speaking Belgium. Uh, I'm Thijs Vrien on Twitter. Please follow me there. This is an experiment I do on, at every talk. I always mention my Twitter handle. And every time I go to my Twitter profile after my talk, I see this slight bump. It's just a slight bump. So let's see if it applies. If you have questions afterwards, I'll skip Q&A entirely. I'll use the 60 minutes for the talk. I'll be hanging around here as well. So if you want to have some, some questions or get a conversation started, get me then or otherwise get me on Twitter. I'm a technical evangelist at a Belgian web hosting company called Combel. Uh, I also work at Sentia, both of the same group. The one is SME, the, one, the other one is Enterprise. We more or less dominate the market in Belgium, the Netherlands, and Denmark. That has nothing to do with the UK. You might have never heard from us. That's perfectly fine. I'm also the author of Getting Started with Varnish Cash, an O'Reilly book that was uh, published last year. So I'm not just about cloud automation. I like caching and everything in the edge as well. Uh, I'm glad to be here. It's 
I am particularly glad to be in the UK. This is my 185th talk, of which it's the 17th I'm doing in the UK, and one of the best experiences I had was in the UK, so I'm really grateful that you took the time out of your schedule to check me out, and I hope we can have a good time. Uh, it's my 11th time in London and my fourth time here at the brewery, a venue that I love. So let's get going. Uh, if you like or hate this talk, could be either of those, could be both, uh, depending, please give me feedback. Give me feedback about the good parts, but also about the bad parts. Uh, not just for me, but for organizers as well. I would love to do this talk at a future conference somewhere else in the world. If you don't agree, give me, give me some criticism. Uh, maybe tell me how I can prove. Ready? Yes? Okay, let's do it then. We're going to do three things today. We're going to build, we're going to provision, and we're going to orchestrate. Those are all fancy terms. Basically, the building part is we're going to take application code and we're going to bake it into a virtual machine image. It, it comes with the, the hype terms like immutable infrastructure, but I won't go that far or, or be that arrogant to call it all that. But in, throughout this example, throughout this presentation, we're going to take some application code, we're going to put it in a virtual machine image, then we're, uh, we're going to use Packer for that, of course. That's a technology that I'll, I'll discuss today. Then we'll pour some proverbial sauce on it. That's the provisioning part. We'll pour some sauce on our, our little cake, the thing we're baking, and that should be the full stack. That should contain all the software that is required to run our application code, which is in our VM. And once we have that VM, uh, again, we'll use Ansible to do that, and once we have our VM, we need to serve our dish in the cloud, and that will be the orchestration part for which we'll use Terraform. Loud and clear? Okay, next steps. Uh, all of this, and that's the beauty of it, falls under the infrastructure as code umbrella. So that means all these configurations that we're using to build the virtual machine image, to put it in the cloud, are readable text files, so to speak. And these could be an essential part of our Git repository where our application code is. It could also be a separate repository. Uh, it could be two things depending on how you're organized. Now, our, our mission is to create disposable stacks in reproducible environments, and let's do just that and introduce our very first technology. It's called Packer. Packer is a product that is open source, but there's an enterprise suite around it built by the people of HashiCorp. HashiCorp are the people who also invented Vagrant. Who's used Vagrant before? Yeah, see? Thought you would know that. Well, that's the same company, and it's actually an interesting company, because they're ahead of their time, and they're figuring out problems that can occur in development, in ops, in the cloud, and figuring out vendor agnostic tools to do so. Packer is just a script of a binary written in Go, and what it does is it interacts with cloud providers, and it's able to build VMs from either of those, and I think the list is growing. By now, maybe the, the list isn't up to date yet, and they, they have new vendors. I will primarily use uh, AWS, Amazon EC2 images, and OpenStack. Those are the two things I use. We do a lot of VMware as well, so it's, it's quite easy to pick one, and it's a single syntax, just a configuration file, a JSON file, in which you define what you need, you run the command, and it builds it, and you have a ready-to-use image at your cloud provider. So let's do it with OpenStack. Uh, who uses OpenStack in here? I don't expect to see many hands. No one? Just to prove my point, I, I have an, a an AWS example as well. Who uses AWS in here? See, yeah, okay, I expected that. But just to show you that there's a lot of similarities in here. So this is a JSON file in which I define my configuration. You see a building stage, which I marked in red, and a provisioning stage. In the building stage, we'll take a source image, which you see here, that is the identifier of my source image in my uh, OpenStack installation, and we'll use that to boot up an image to do all the things we need to do in this very stupid example. I'm installing Nginx via an inline shell script, and then we need to have some network settings to be able to connect to that machine, and in the end, we'll turn that into a new image. The image is called Teisferin underscore, and then some variable interpolation in which I put the current timestamp, and that will be my ready-to-use image based on a typical Debian stretch, so that's a Debian 9 64-bit installation with Nginx installed, and that will be my machine image. It's just an example, of course. In AWS terms, it's very similar. Just maybe some more subtle things like you have an AMI name and a source AMI, but the rest is more or less the same. Uh, I deliberately left my credentials empty. I don't want you to be logging onto my Amazon account, preferably. So, but you probably need to have the, like for OpenStack, you need to refer to the endpoint, the tenant name, some key settings. Well, you have to do the same thing for Amazon. So it's very, very simple. And you run your command, back or build of that JSON file, and you end up with an image that is already registered with your cloud vendor. So it's not on your local computer, it's out there, ready to use, ready to orchestrate. 
This is a schematic, a schematic uh, representation of it. So what it does, that Packer build reads your JSON file and calls Cloud APIs, and it actually boots up a server there. So it boots up computing power on which it does all the mumbo jumbo, uh, in this case, a shell provisioning script. Uh, it stops it, it takes a snapshot, it registers it, and you're all done. And you could use the tools like the CLI tools of OpenStack, and if you do image list, you'll see that image there, ready to use, readily available. Same thing for Amazon. If you run a command like this, you'll see that this VM image is ready to use, and then we just have to use Ansible to make it enrich it a bit, because that stupid apt get install uh, minus y nginx command that won't really cut it. You'll, you'll need a, a little bit more elaborate systems to do that, and Ansible is just a thing. Who uses Ansible in here? Who does not? I would rather know that. Okay, so I would say more than 50% use Ansible here. Well, I'm preaching to the choir, but I'll still do it. It's a configuration management system. It's very similar to tools like Chef and Puppet and SaltStack and you know, CF Engine and other stuff. What it primarily does, it is responsible for installing uh, software to configure your machine and to make sure that the full stack is ready so that you have a VM image that is provisioned or not even a VM image, you could run it on existing infrastructure in a, a more traditional setup and make sure that based on playbooks, based on sort of recipe, you'll have a system that is completely up to spec. And the thing I like about Ansible is it's very lightweight, it's written in Python, there's no agents involved, it's just is is h commands over the wire, and you read YAML files, playbooks as they call it, and you run those and those contain instructions on what files should be present, what uh, permissions they should have, which packages should be installed, which services should run, and so on and so forth. There's ways to organize that, I'll show that in a minute, and it's basically installing so software and configuring your server. Again, this is not an Ansible talk, but I'll show you uh, a pretty basic playbook that I used. So what you do is you match your hosts to your inventory, and in this case, this could be installed on every server in my inventory. And I define some variables being, this is my web folder or the code folders that need to be synchronized with my VM image in the end. That's just a variable. Uh, we do become true, which is a sort of pseudo su kind of approach so that you have root access. And then you execute a set of tasks. This is very descriptive, right? Just YAML based, update our APT repository, install Vim, curl, nginx, php, rsync, do some folder stuff. You get the message, right? Yeah, is this clear? L let's skip it, let's, let's go to the next one. Uh, another thing I'm doing is synchronizing my application based on that variable. So in the end, I'll have an nginx, I'll have PHP, my code will be there, and I'm ready to rock. But in real production environments, you won't keep it that simple. You'll organize it in a much more intricate way. And I have a tree here, I wish I can show you how you could typically do that. This is a bit of an abstracted version, but it, it would cover it. So in this tree, you see a thing called roles, and roles are, are more or less modules, encapsulated logic that contain variables, that contain templates, that contains the full-blown installation for a component. That could be Nginx, could be MySQL, could be PHP, could be whatever you want to use. But it has lots of settings you can configure, you can tweak, and you're not exposing yourself to the complexity of it all. So you see here that you have some defaults that you can set, some handlers to restart, some meta information, tasks to execute, maybe templates you parse, a virtual host system, a PHP INI file, you name it. But that's all nicely encapsulated, and you don't really need to be exposed to that. If you have logic that extends that, you could easily run and include custom tasks, have custom templates, custom files, and variables you want to extend, you do that either on a host basis or on a group basis. With host bases, I mean you can match a host and say that host should have X amount of PHP workers, for example, and those PHP workers could be defined in your PHP role. You can extend them at the host level. If you group certain servers, let's say you have four web servers and you create a group web, then you could define that these workers are set on a group level. So basically, this is more or less the best practices on how to organize your Ansible stuff, and then you can apply it on your virtual machines. And in terms of applying them, it is a lot cleaner if your playbook looks like this. You include a couple of custom tasks and the, less, the rest is just roles and variables are defined elsewhere. If you would run this separately without Packer, it would look a little bit like this. Ansible playbook, run your playbook, everything gets bootstrapped, and the end result is that you have uh, a setup that is completely up to spec, and you can run that in tests, in production, in QA, you'll have uh, identical environments, basically. But we won't be doing that, we'll be replacing our provisioning part where this used to be the shell execution, and just put Ansible in there, register our playbook, and we're good to go. And in the background, Ansible run a very complicated one. This is the one I ran on my laptop. This is what Ansible will do for you. 
in the end. It will match your inventory dynamically. It will take the playbook. It will register all kinds of variables. And you're good to go. So instead of doing the shell script, we're doing, we're doing much more advanced stuff and running our custom, custom Ansible playbooks. In the end, we'll add a, a little bit more magic and we'll add a post processor of the type manifest. And the manifest is nothing more than a JSON file where all the build steps are registered. You can use that in your CI CD pipeline to see what has happened. So in the end, it will store your build results with your artifact data right there in a readable format. And this is what it looks like. I deliberately put an Amazon and an OpenStack build next to one another. You can match the last run ID right here, like B6000, uh, uh, well, that's just that one, that's the last one. And then you can see the artifact ID, and the artifact ID is a, a given identifier, a unique ID that was assigned by your cloud provider. So in this case, EF90 and what have you, this is the ID of my freshly baked image at the OpenStack site. And you can use JQ uh, just to parse that. You use JQ as well, right, Mike? Brilliant uh, tool, command line tool, just uh, to get that artifact ID out of it. And here I could prove it if I do OpenStack image list. That very ID, that's the one I could use to orchestrate it. Now I recorded a video for that because I don't want to bore you sitting here for 20 minutes waking it, making, waiting until it gets baked. So what I do, I, I've sped it up. I use some uh, video editing software to do it rapidly. So we'll do a Packer build. I know this font is rather small. I tried my best. But you don't have to read it. You just have to see the movement and the colors to <laughs> just to get a sense of it. So we're opening it up. We're firing off an image. We're associating some network settings, assigning an SSH key, running our Ansible script. We're stopping the server. Once the server is fully stopped, we're creating a snapshot of it. Snapshot gets registered as an image. And then the end result is that you see here EF90AD1. Uh, that's our image. Create it right there and then. And then we have to do something with that image. And that's the next step. And that's the rest of the presentation, is using Terraform to leverage these kinds of things. So uh, we could use two terms for it. We could say, we'll deploy our image. But I think deployment is way too simple. Uh, and, and it doesn't really cover the entire spectrum. Because deploying an image would just imply, we have a VM, we give it the image, we're done. But when you look at it from an OpenStack, an Azure, an Amazon, and Google Cloud perspective, the term orchestration fits the needs a lot more because it's more than just setting up a server. It's actually launching a virtual data center with all these components. And I won't go all over all of them. Uh, you probably know that you need to provide IP space and subnets and routing information and security information, all these kinds of things. Uh, that is rather complicated, and they depend vendor per vendor. But it's perfectly feasible. Uh, there are tools out there in the different uh, cloud vendor uh, products, like CloudFormation for AWS. Uh, there's a heat orchestration suite for OpenStack, resource manager at Azure. We won't be using those. We'll be using Terraform, and Terraform directly interacts with the APIs of those cloud vendors. So it doesn't use or leverage the orchestration tools. It uses the APIs directly. It's also infrastructure as code. So you read human readable files that contain all the definitions we want, vendor agnostic. You can plan them in advance, and it will give you it will estimate what it needs to do and show you the actions that need to be undertaken. You can visualize this in a graph form. You can execute those commands. This is also a tool that is written in, uh, in Go. It's a single binary. It's also by the people, the lovely people of HashiCorp. Uh, you could have multiple providers. You can boot up some stuff with Amazon, some stuff with Azure. You can have some Google instances. And you could, in theory, make it all work together quite nicely. And again, it interacts with the APIs. It does not leverage their orchestration suite. And there's tons more providers. This is just the list, baffling list of tools you can use. For the sake of this presentation, I'll only use AWS. And based on the show of hands and what you guys are using, I think it makes much more sense to stick to that. So it all starts with a simple TF file. Uh, if you have a, a directory where you want to put all these configurations, you just put a random TF file. I just chose main.tf. Put whatever, put blah.tf and it, it will bootstrap it automatically. And here's our first scenario, code on screen. That is what you like, right? Code on the screen. We have a set of variables. We can have resources. We can have data sets. We can have outputs. There's differences to it. But you have to think about it as a way to interact with these APIs. That's the premise. It interacts with APIs. Variables provide input that we can use in a later stage. So we have a variable called AMI here, which if you follow along, uh, if you haven't fallen asleep just yet. That's that custom VM image that we just baked. We're going to pass that AMI, that 
ID of our, our image there, and it'll get bootstrapped. It has a default value. If I don't provide a custom value myself, it will use AMI, E1, E8, so on and so forth. This is the official Debian stretch image. It will just launch a blank Debian server if you don't provide a custom AMI. What you can do in Terraform is either have a, a TF vars file, just a variables file, where you define the variables that you want to use, or you can use the minus var command line argument and pipe them in uh, directly into the application. Once we have that, we'll bootstrap an instance. It's of the type AWS instance, so Terraform will be clever enough to figure out that that should be an EC2 image, and it's called web. We refer to it as, a, as web. These names don't really collide because you see I use web here, I use web there, I use web there. Those names don't really collide because they're of a different resource type. So what we'll be doing here is using our AMI variable, either the custom Debian uh, or the, the, the stock Debian stretch, or even our custom image, and then we'll uh, assign an, an instance type to it. I'm using T2 micro right now, don't use this in production, this is just the tiniest of tiny. Uh, for the sake of this preparation of this talk, I didn't want to spend a lot of money, so I used the tiny ones. I have a predefined uh, security group, which is just the firewall settings for web. It opens up 443, it opens up 80. It gives us access throughout HTTP. And then we give it some tags. AWS has a tagging system. If you use the name tag, that will help you in your graphical interface to spot it in the name column. Once we've done that, we want to link the public IP address that is associated with that and link it to a DNS record. But we don't have information. I don't know the ID right now of my zone. But what I can use is a data format. That's a data source. And that data source will do a get on the API based on an identifier. And that identifier is name. So I have an aws.combell.com zone at Amazon, and I'll retrieve it. And I could use variable interpolation to get the ID from it. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a record. I'm, I'm going to create an A record, an A record, a DNS record, where I link the IP address to the host name. So what I'm doing here is variable interpolation. Data, AWS Route 53 zone, so right here, it's called web, and I want a zone ID. So it will fetch that, fetch that state, inject it there, and then we can have a naming convention to it. My nodes should be called tesfrind-web, and then the name of the zone. So that should be tesfrind-web.aws.combell.com. And we continue on. It's an A record. It's valid for 60 seconds, and then it, the TTL gets refreshed. That's the theoretical minimum. If you want to be nice to the internet, increase that a bit. If you don't want to be nice to the internet, leave it at 60. And then you'll eventually have an IP address linked to it, and that is of our AWS instance, which is also called web, grab the public IP. And that will do its magic. That will create an instance, create an A record, or change an A record, depending on its existence. And in the end, it will output those values. I want the public IP of my web server, and I want the host name of my DNS record. That's just our main TF file. Once we have that, we'll run Terraform init. Terraform init is clever enough to bootstrap those files and to figure out which plugins it needs. And as you can see, it has figured out that it needs the AWS plugin, the provider. It will fetch that from its repository, and it will say, hey, I have provider AWS here, version 1.8. I'm ready to rock and roll. You run the planning part, and then you could already imagine what is going to happen. And it will use state for that. It will use uh, remote, the remote state that is out there, so it will synchronize with the platform, see if anything that we've defined is already there, and it will use our data set here to, to figure out what the zone is. And then it will show you what it needs to do. And in this case, there's only creation part, because we had nothing there. It will install an, a web instance, and it will display the information that it already has, the AMI, the fact that we uh, want a single block device, we have a security group called web, uh, we have a, a tag called web, uh, and we have a DNS record that needs to be created. All the rest says compute it and will be filled up in the local state we have in our directory because state will be created and that will be filled up later on based on what the API returns. Once you're comfortable doing that, you run Terraform apply and it will create the record, it will create the server, it will link the one and the other one together. What I would also advise you to do is if you want to be consistent in your state, once you do the plan, you can output the plan to a binary file, to blah, and it will contain your provider information, your authentication information, and the entire state that it needs to execute. And if you do Terraform apply blah, it will use just that. And again, I have a video for you explaining how that works, how you could leverage that. Again, heavily sped up. We apply it. It will create everything. Most of it is computed. The instance is created. We're creating a DNS record based on that IP address that we've got. And it just created two resources. It didn't have to change anything. It did not have to destroy anything. And the outputs that are registered are host name, 
and the IP that is associated with that. All of this information will be stored in the local state, even my host name and my public IP. And if I run Terraform output, it will output those stuff from state, so you could retrieve it. Or if you want to use that in an automation script, you can JSON it, and it will send it in JSON format. You can register certain variables, outputs or input variables, as sensitive. If they are sensitive, they won't be displayed. They'll be used internally, but they'll be encrypted in a way. And if we do Terraform show, we can actually retrieve the state that was computed. So you run Terraform show, and all these parameters that were supposed to be computed are now readable, visible, ready to use. And there's tons of them. Too much to care about. But our outputs are also registered. Now, I, we're 25 minutes into this presentation. I've mentioned the word state quite a lot. And I need to explain how that works in Terraform and how, why state is so important and why this is a, a very uh, colorful feature. Terraform is the binary. It reads your files. There's a state backend, and there's a cloud API it synchronizes it with. If there's nothing there, it will fetch it all from the cloud API stored in state. If it sees changes to your TF files, it will calculate what it already knows and synchronize it with uh, what is out there. And by default, state is just a set of files, these two files, a TF state file and a backup of that file. And in essence, those files are just JSON files, nothing more to it. You can open them up, and you'll see all this information in JSON files. Now, there's also, and I would advise you to use that when you run it in a production environment, to use remote state, because uh, the state on local files, it's not synchronized, right? If you work in Teams and both of you run the script, there's no way to update the state. And you'll probably have clashes and locking issues, uh, things that go wrong when two people from the same team, maybe at different computers, run the same script. So you have ways to synchronize your state in the cloud. Uh, you can use console or etcd or GCS. Uh, it, you have a bunch of tools. Throughout, uh, and, and that will be near the end of the presentation, I will use console to prove my point and show you how useful that remote state is. But for now, let's stick with it. And one of the consequences of state is if you don't apply a high availability plan, things will go wrong on you. Uh, this is a Terraform plan where I'm uh, injecting another custom AMI. This is an example how you pass on variables to, to Terraform. I say minus var AMI is that AMI. Now that one is different. So when I do the planning stage, there's two things happening. Terraform will try to figure out what it needs to do, and it will know which API calls are available. So you see a tilde update in place. That means there's probably a patch or a, a put call at the Amazon side to do it in line without having to recreate something. But since we have changed our AMI, and since an AMI and the instance that it's running, it's one and the same, you can't just change the AMI to change the virtual image on a machine because that's basically what the machine is. Terraform is clever enough to figure out that it first needs to destroy the running instance and then recreate it in order to get to that desired state. You see the changes there, AMI E1E to 2OC, that's, that's an entirely different machine. Now luckily, Updating the DNS records doesn't require us to delete it. It could be done, you see the tilde here, in place. When you do the apply of that, you'll have a problem because it will be gone. <laughs> it will say, oh, yeah, you want me to change that? Let me delete that instance for you. And it will delete it, and it will boot it back up. But since this is just a stupid DNS record, it will probably be some negative caching, and you'll have downtime of 10 minutes, and it will be gone. And that's not something you want. So. Let's make it a bit more intricate, a bit more interesting, and let's start adding a high availability plan. And the tool we'll be using within Terraform is the concept of workspaces, having different workspaces. Every workspace, uh, so you'll have a single Terraform project with multiple workspaces, and every workspace has its own state. So if you run something, if you run a plan, you change the workspace, you run the plan again, it won't try to delete or update anything, it'll just fire up an, new, an entirely new stack of infrastructure, which is great for blue-green deployments. Now, in a blue-green green state of mind, you'll have that entry point, and the entry point could be a load balancer, it could be a DNS record, it could be an IP address, an elastic IP address that is relayed. Well, you're probably gonna start with a single workspace in which you're gonna fire up a set of infrastructure, and then the next piece, in the next part, you wanna have that new deployment ready, but you don't wanna update it, you wanna stack it up next to it, do some validation of some sorts, and then when you're ready, you'll switch it in a sort of atomic way. And you could do that in a secondary workspace, and here are the commands to do so. So you initialize your Terraform project, you create a new workspace, let's say it's called Workspace 1, you create a second one, you select the first one, you plan and apply, it will boot up your infrastructure, and then you could do 
A secondary one, change some files, change some state, plan and apply it again, and you're ready to go. And in terms of the file system, if you use local state, it will create a, a tfstate.d folder and have state per workspace. And then you could switch and run it separately and, and do changes. It, it would be interesting to name those workspaces according to your pipeline, maybe test, staging, production, acceptance, so on and so forth. And the good thing is that there's also a workspace variable within the Terraform namespace that will allow you to maybe interpolate that data into the name of your instance. Let's say you have this very same file and we update the name tag and inject the workspace in it. If it's in a single account and you have two workspaces, you won't see the difference between them. It would be called Tesferin Web, both staging and production or, or deployment one, deployment two. There's no way to see the difference. But if you use the workspaces and inject it there, you'll clearly see what is what. What we also have done in this is you don't see the DNS part anymore because we've pulled the DNS part out because that's, oh, let me go back, that's the atomic switch that needs to happen in the end. That's a secondary stage. That's the second Terraform project we'll execute. Because first we have the existing information, we'll bootstrap the second one, and that will be a separate endpoint, a separate validation process. And once we know that works, then we want to do the switch. And that means that then we want DNS to be executed. And what we'll do here is create a variable IP, a separate DNS project, and inject it in the record. So once we're done, we run that secondary Terraform project, do Terraform apply, pass along the right variable like this, and get it done. Just for the fun of it, we're going to use DNS round robin. Don't use this as a, 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 def a definitive high availability plan, but it could work. Uh, so what I want to prove here is not that DNS round robin is a good idea, but that you can use uh, multiple instances and that you can link those. So what we're doing here is implementing a count, count property that says of that instance, create two or three or five or ten, and the default is two. We can extend that via a command line argument or a variables file, and then we interpolate the name again, web, and then we format it, uh, count plus one, so that will be web one, web two, web three, web four, and we'll also assign the workspace to it. And then the output to public IP is no longer a single IP, but is instance web asterisk, so all the web servers, and grab their public IP, and that will be a list. And the only thing to do in our next stage, to keep it a bit secure, is to enforce it that the input is also of the type list. That way you can't really pass a single IP. And uh, records is also a list, so that doesn't need to change. And so when you apply that, you apply a list, multiple IP addresses. And this is just showboating. This is just me showing you that you can fork off and, and, and bootstrap multiple instances in a single resource definition. That was blue-green. Maybe you should focus on rolling deployments and make it a lot more complicated. So instead of switching that entry point atomically, why not, and, and this is very much a recap of Mike's presentation about AWS uh, this morning, uh, we will we'll have an auto-scaling group. Within that auto-scaling group, there's a launch configuration that defines what kind of EC2 instances, what kind of machines we want, and it just dynamically adds them. So when we do a new deployment, we'll update that launch configuration, we'll create a new launch configuration, and Terraform will be clever enough to notify the auto-scaling group and say, hey, relink this new uh, launch configuration, and then gradually these new machines will boot up, and the auto-scaling group will be clever enough to drain information, drain connections from our previous deployment, and gradually use the new ones. And that is uh, a combination of using a, a load balancer and an auto-scaling group. So the auto-scaling group is just one of the tools I used, and uh, I have a, a poor man's Visio <laughs> right here. This is just me designing really poorly designed <laughs> schematics. But the goal is to show you that there's lots of information there. So we start off, let me walk this way, with a VPC, a virtual private cloud. Is that the right abbreviation, VPC? I'm not an Amazon certified engineer, so lots of uh, acronyms here. VPC is just our, our own little uh, private environment that had its own CIDR, so its own IP space. We assign a set of uh, networks to it, two public subnets, which are hosted in two different data centers, two private subnets also hosted in those two different data centers. We have an application load balancer attached to it. An application load balancer has targets. These targets are VMs that it distributes it to. These are uh, thrown out by the auto-scaling group. It uses a launch configuration. We have a custom AMI. We have some... Uh, Cloud, uh, CloudWatch metrics to figure out, do we need more capacity, do we need less capacity? 
just a lot of work. Uh, I won't show all the details. Maybe I could publish this on GitHub later and distribute it through Twitter, so you'll have a reason to follow me on Twitter. Uh, but I'll, I'll show you bits and pieces of the configuration just to show you how much you could do with Terraform. So this is our VPC, and it has the subnet uh, or the, the, the CIDR of 10.0.0.0.6 slash 16. And we give it a name. And then we have a subnet that depends on that VPC, and that defines another piece of subnet information, which is hosted in EU West 2A. So it's in Data Center 2A. This is also in Data Center 2A, and that's a private IP space. And then we'll have probably public IP 2, that is in 2B, and private IP 2, that is 2B. And we have some firewalling information that it opens up 80 and 443 and 22 and so on and so forth. And we have our custom AMI. Now, what's a novelty here is that we're using a data source to retrieve the AMI. In my previous example, this was just injected via a variable, something I pushed in. But what I'm doing now is I'm looking for AMIs that are owned by user A2648. That's my own user. And we apply a set of filters. It needs HVM virtualization as a type. And it needs to start with days for the underscore asterisk. And we will take the most recent one. So every time we push a new one via Packer and we run Terraform plan, it will have figured out that there's a new version of the AMI. And it will figure out what needs to happen. So it will create a new launch configuration. It will update our auto-scaling group. This is our launch configuration. It uses data AWS AMI, tastefitting underscore Terraform dot ID. So it takes my, the ID of my latest image. It pushes it in there. It uses these. Uh, these security groups I have a load balancer that is also in that subnet, a listener that listens on port 80, a target group that also listens on port 80 that communicates with the load balancer. Lots of information, right? Lots of stuff passing. The goal is not to teach you how to do this. Uh, there's plenty of resources online about this. I just want to show you that there's lots of moving uh, parts, lots of components that you can orchestrate. And eventually, I'll get to my point. This is the build-up. We have an auto-scaling group. It has a minimum size of three servers. And at the maximum, if it needs the capacity, it will have 10. It uses a launch configuration that I previously defined that depended on that data source that had my custom e AMI in it. It will throw all these instances. Once it forks it off, it boots them up. It will put them in the target group. Uh, and it will have some more information here. We're using policies to increase or decrease our capacity from our auto-scaling group. We have a CloudWatch metric, an alarm, a high watermark, so to speak. Uh, it uses namespacing. It uses the AWS application ELB namespace. So what we're doing is we're using metrics that Amazon collects from the different components. And in this case, we'll, we'll look at the load balancer. And if the load balancer, the specific metrics of that, the request count per target, so if you look at the load balancer positioned here with all your servers there, if the amount of connections per target, per server, is 20 or more within a period, an interval of 60 seconds, for my test case, this is con considered high load. We need to trigger more servers. So we'll use that. And it will have more servers. And we do Terraform plan, Terraform apply, and all that stuff happens, and it dynamically deploys our new instances. If, there's a, if you run it again and a new AMI was registered via our, our Packer build, it will figure it out. It will create a new launch configuration. It will update the auto-scaling group. The auto-scaling group will automatically deploy the new images. Old ones will be drained. Old ones will be removed. And I could show this in a graphical format. You could just do Terraform graph, send it to your dot binary, save it as a PNG, and that will be it. Simple, right? Very simple. Uh, so what the, what the point is that I'm trying to make is not that yeah, Terraform is enormously powerful and it abstracts lots of the complexities because I don't have s that much AWS experience. But by using Terraform, it was very easy to learn how it worked. But what I would advise you is to store it all, organize it nicely according to its role in separate files, to keep it simple, to keep it readable, because all that, it looks like JSON, but it's not really JSON, that all that formatting, it, it'll, it'll get tedious, it'll get confusing. So you want to store your provider information there. I, I deliberately didn't show you provider information, because I didn't register my, my, my keys or uh, all, all private information for OpenStack or a AWS. I didn't register that because I used environment variables that were set. But you can also have a provider construct in which you say what the endpoint is where you want to connect to and what your access key is and your secret key. You can store that here. Network information, computation information, maybe SSH key pairs, security groups, your outputs, your variables. You could store that all separately. And that's a good way of doing it. But there's even a better way. And that's by using modules. And this is where it gets really interesting. Instead of throwing it all in separate files, like a networking.tf, a keypair.tf, you can create folders per role. 
Like we'll have an auto scaling folder and we'll have a DNS folder and a launch folder. And in that, you'll have a, a sort of uh, convention, a naming convention with a readme file, a main.tf that contains your main logic, an outputs.tf that generates outputs, uh, and variables.tf. Now, the clever part about these things are variables contain the input, outputs are expected to print stuff on, on screen. But if you work from it uh, from a, a modular point of view, outputs are just like function returns. It's just a way to interact with your main logic. Because in the end, all of these modules will be bootstrapped by your main Terraform file. So outputs are just like return true or return blah. It essentially does that. And variables are our function inputs. So let's, let's take it apart. Let's take our DNS module, for example. This is just boilerplate, right? Don't use this. Don't use any of this I'm, I'm doing, just to show you how it works. You know our previous construction for that uh, DNS record? Well, what you could do is uh, define a variable called zone name and preset it. So this now works for aws.combel.com. Do you want to do it for your own zone? Well, then set it in your main file later on. This is a, an input. You have your record name, which is empty. We have a, a variable records, which is a list and has no default value, so it's required to be extended when we invoke it. Uh, we have... Uh, our, our Route 53 zone, which is our data source. And then we'll have some information about the record, some interpolation. And in the end, we'll return the DNS endpoint, the frequently, the fully qualified domain name, FQDN, of that record that we created, and we'll return that. And how do we invoke it? Pretty simple. We have a module DNS. We mention the folder where it is located, and we extend the variables that we want to extend. So uh, I left the record name empty, so it would be the main zone. What we're doing here is creating a www record. It was a C name record, not an A record. What is the record you want to connect it to? To blah.domain.com. And you could output it to screen. And the cool thing about the interpolation is you don't go to the native uh, DNS record. You say module DNS, which is that one, take the DNS endpoint. And DNS endpoint was an output I registered. So it's just like a function or, or, or a, a method. You, you put input in there, you return output. And all the complexity of what happens behind the curtains is abstracted for you. And you can do it that way. You'll have a networking part. The networking uh, exposes a VPC. That VPC information, you can use that in your load balancing or, or your security groups, module, networking, security group ID. And you can tie them all together. And all these pages of logic are now compacted into a single script reasonably easy to work with. Now, this is just one way of doing it. There's also a registry out there, out in the open, called registryterraform.io. This is a screenshot of it, and they have all kinds of use cases based on providers. You'll find lots of AWS stuff. So that entire VPC thing, maybe they have a better implementation. I'm pretty sure they have a better implementation. And you can use that, and you can use that in several ways. Uh, if you use their registry, you can just use module console, and you don't need that files on your on those files on your disk. You can just refer to the namespace HashiCorp and then console AWS. You do Terraform dot init, and it will be clever enough to figure it out. It will say, "I'm checking what we need." So we have an empty directory just with that file. So again, that's the only thing that is in your main.tf, and it will be clever enough to figure out that it needs AWS providers and that it needs that plugin, and we'll just run it, and you're done. Fairly simple, and all the complexity is abstracted away. It's not restricted to the Terraform registry. You can have GitHub repositories or bare, just standard Git repos. And there's more. You can have local files, Terraform registry, GitHub, Bitbucket, generic Git repos, Mercurial, HTTP, S3. So there's plenty of ways to distribute and share these modules that you created and that you maintain and are reusable. Right? Still on board? Let's go to the final part, or one of the final parts. That's remote state. It's a promise I made to you that in the end we would talk about remote state. Let me get some of that water first before we continue. Maybe it's a good idea to pour some water for yourself. Mm. All right, apologies. Remote state is particularly interesting if you work in teams. I explained the difficulties already. If you have multiple people working on the same uh, project, you're not 100% sure when or what will be executed at what time. If you use local state, if you use the local disk and you execute the plan and someone else executes the plan, there's no way to synchronize those files in a, in a standard way. So you'll end up with a big mess and you can have a risk downtime. But if you have a centralized location to store your state remotely, that will be a lot easier, especially when working in teams. 
I explained that there's plenty of ways to do it, S3, uh, HTTP, GET. I like console, or you could use etcd. Console is just a key value store, an advanced key value store in, in sort of cluster format. It's also by HashiCorp, and it's a way to keep track of state, to do locking. Setting it up is quite easy, but when you want to do it on your laptop for testing purposes, this is just a command. Again, it's also a Go binary, single Go binary. You run it in agent mode, you indicate the location where you store all, all the data files, and then you say, I want a server, you want a graphical interface to, to do some searching, and you want to do it in dev mode. When you do it in dev mode, it won't require a cluster with multiple servers. And the only thing you need to do then is provide some TF file where you'll, where you'll put that construct and say, my backend is of the type console. This is the address, localhost port 8500, for example. And this is the namespace, the path in that key value store where you want to store it. If you have multiple people trying the same thing, you'll get a locking error that will cause you so, that will prevent from causing you so much trouble. And this is a good way of, of making sure that things don't go down. But there's another thing you could do. You could leverage that and create a data source that uses that state. Because throughout these examples that I've shown you, communication between different Terraform projects happen throughout variables or variable files, like a variable file where all these variables were located, or command line arguments where these variables were set. This is not always the easiest way, and especially if you have, uh, if different stages could run on different machines. There's no real way to send these IPs over or send these commands over the wire. So what you'll do is uh, keep track of the state there. You, you'll, uh, you'll have a data source and that DNS record where that IP, that public IP used to be sent over the command line, you could just read it from there. You could just read it from that data source. So you have a place where you set the state that is here. You'll probably have that somewhere in your code. And then at the, at the other project, you can even rely on local state if you want to and read that remote state and that will fetch all the information you need, in this case, an output that was registered, which is called public IP, and it will just take that and store it in there, and you'll have communication over the wire throughout uh, a sort of consensus system, basically with console S. So instead of using CLI variables, use remote state to communicate between the different aspects, maybe the different projects. And as a, a final note, uh, does that mean you can do hybrid cloud? That's one of the questions I often get asked because you could combine Amazon and Azure, and you can put uh, Google into it. In theory, yes, but we all know that these vendors are optimized only for their own toolkit. If you have to go out their data center and go over the public internet to another data center, there will be a cost involved. The connection speed might not be what you expect it to be. So yes, it is entirely possible. Maybe you can use an external DNS system that is part of the stack and combine it with some VMware stuff that is hosted at your company that could work fine but I'm not 100% sure if combining Azure with Amazon and Google all together, if that would be faster or cheaper. If there are features that are not in your cloud environment of choice, yes, that could work. But if you're just using it for the sake of redundancy, I would go for multi-availability zones, multi-regions. That was that. I would like to thank you for being there. If you want more information about what I do, about the books I write, the videos I make, the presentations I give, Farin.eu is the place. And if you just want to follow me on social, those are the spots. Again, join in, give me feedback, help me improve this presentation. I want to <laughs> travel the world for free. I want to do more presentations. Help me out. If you liked it, please let me know there as well. And with that being said, thanks for hanging out with me. This is the end. <laughs>